any other book in your New Testament will teach you what it means to be a spiritual person. Now, a lot of us can't even define what that means. A lot of us think that means we go to church, we do religious things. Well, Paul will tell you you can go to church and do religious things and not be a spiritual person. So Paul is talking about a very specific situation that is endangering their spiritual life. And we know the situation. There's people that follow Paul, these places that he planted churches, and they basically tell the person, the people that Paul, what Paul said was good, but he didn't give you the whole story. Here's page two. And page two has to do with keeping the law. And the very first part of that is circumcision, becoming Jewish. Now, they think that they're leading these people in a good spiritual path. And Paul says, no, 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 no. And last week, we talked about those weak and miserable principles that Paul said you're going back to. You remember that? Let's, uh, let's review that. We're in Galatians chapter 4. And you guys are there already because I asked you to be there. Okay. It says here, um, verse 8, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who were by nature not gods. But now that you know God, or rather, are known by God, how is it you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my effort on you. When Paul brought the message of Jesus to them, all they knew about gods was that they had to appease them. They had to keep them off their back. And to do that, they took special festivals, and special days, and special ceremonies, and special sacrifices. And if you did it all just right, then you could weave your way through this unseen world without anybody messing with you. Paul said, you were free from that, Jesus. He sent a spirit into your heart that called out, Abba, Father. He sent the spirit that, that gave you a relationship with your Creator. And you're moving away from that. And you're going back to weak and miserable principles. Now, he says, I plead with you, brothers, become like me, for I became like you. You have done me no wrong. And as you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Though, even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Jesus, Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to all your joy? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy? By telling you the truth. Paul was the first one that ever spoke to them about Jesus and told them the good news that the creator of all the universe, the only God there is, loved them so much. That he came to earth and became flesh. And he died for them so they could have a relationship. So, so you can know what God's nature is like by looking at Jesus. And so that you can have the spirit, the spirit that cries out in that relationship. Right? Yeah. He said, All right, I didn't even plan to be there. I was there because of an illness. And then he says this weird thing about eyes. Notice that? He said, I, 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 I know that it was a trial to you, but you, you guys would have torn out your own eyes and given them to me. Paul had trouble with his eyes. He did. You know, during his conversion on the road to Damascus, and then he was blinded, and then when Ananias came to him and some scales fell off his eyes, and he could see, but he still had problems with his eyes. And if you look in his letters, you'll see evidence of that. He'll say things at the end like, I, Paul, am writing this in my own hands. See how large I write? Okay, why do people write large? Because they can't see very well. He said, I was there and I was preaching to you and I was having some serious trouble. And, and it could have been something that really put you off. 
but it didn't. He said, you treated me like I was an angel, somebody the messenger from God, or, or, or Jesus himself. You were so full of joy about the message. We were so close. You were so excited about me. What happened? What happened? What changed all that? Where did your joy go? Now when they think of Paul, they're going, oh yeah, Paul. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, he didn't teach me about circumcision. He didn't teach me about the law. Yeah, I know, he got me going. He said, yeah, Paul. Yeah, Paul. He said, man, have I become your enemy? Have I become somebody that is causing you ill because I told you the truth? And now he's going to tell us something very, very, very important. And I want you to hang with me and hear what Paul has to say. It says here, those people, what people are we talking about? The circumcision group. The people that came and trying to get you to become Jewish. Those people are zealous to win you over. Zealous. What a cool word. Zeal. Do you have zeal? We say passion. Do you have passion? Are you really excited about something? They're excited about this. They're zealous about it. You know, zeal, it, it's a church word. They don't even know the origin of this word that we use in our, our English language. But it is a church word. It has to do with imitation. Wanting to be like somebody. He said, they're zealous to win you over, but for no good. They want to alienate you from us so that you may be zealous for them. Paul versus those people. Who are you going to be excited about? Because there's quite a contract between the two of them, right? They don't even have the same message. Yeah, Paul talks about Jesus. He talks about grace. He talks about forgiveness. He talks about the Spirit. They talk about the law. They talk about morality. They talk about following certain rules, keeping certain days, certain months, certain years. Certain seasons. Which one are you going to be excited about? He said, they, they want you to be excited about them. All right. He says here, it's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good. And to be, all, to be so always, and not just when I'm with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed with you. Have you ever been perplexed? Isn't that a wonderful feeling? What are you doing today? Well, I thought I'd spend some time being perplexed. Perplexed. Here's my birthday wish for you this year. I wish that you'd be perplexed. Anybody want to be perplexed? Yeah, but you are probably sometimes anyway. You don't know what to do. You see that there's a problem. You see that there's an answer. But somebody can't get the two together. And so you're perplexed. You see behavior in someone's life that's hurting them. That's causing them spiritual ruin. And you try to help them, but you can't because they don't want to hear it and you are perplexed. What do I do? And Paul said, you know, this is like going through childbirth. I'm in pain about this issue. And here's what's going on. There are some religious leaders who want you to follow them. Title of this section, The Power of Religious Leaders. Because... It's a really scary topic. But it is something that can ruin you spiritually. If you want to mess up somebody's life spiritually, you get excited about some religious leader. That's it. You get them to hold up one man over everybody else. 